Hello and welcome to another interesting class in history with Ado Lebatamjo. In this class, we shall be discussing apartheid legislation and the suppression of African nationalist movement in the theme, Prelude to Apartheid. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to discuss the legislative provisions against the African population in South Africa, also examine the successes and failures of African resistance to apartheid, and lastly, discuss the effects of apartheid legislation in South Africa. When you come across apartheid, one thing that should come to your mind is South Africa, because apartheid was practiced in South Africa. At the beginning of the 20th century, South Africa was made up of four states, as you can see on the map there. The states were the Cape Colony, Neta, these two were British colonies. And then you also have Transvaal and Orange Free States. These two were colonies controlled by the Boers or the Dutch. At the beginning of the 20th century, that is from around 1908 to 1909, the British colonial masters, they called for a convention by these four states. So delegates of the British and the Dutch, that is the Boers, they attended this convention. And the aim of calling this convention was to unite these states together to have a union of South Africa. By 1910, the Union of South Africa was formed as a result of the decisions reached from this convention. After the formation of this union, some laws were made which were against African populations in South Africa. These laws were referred to as legislative provisions or apartheid legislation. And so in this discussion, we shall be using the term interchangeably. We may either use apartheid legislation or legislative provisions. These laws discriminated against Africans, and since it was passed by the parliament, it became a legal framework upon which apartheid was established in South Africa. Let's look at apartheid legislation. By apartheid legislation, we mean laws or acts of parliament that discriminated or segregated between Africans and Europeans. You may hear of whites and non-whites. The whites here were the Europeans and the non-whites were mostly the Africans and sometimes the Asians. Laws were passed in South Africa that segregated between the races. It is also called racial discrimination. These laws were many. Some examples of these laws or legislations which promoted apartheid policy in South Africa were the Land Ownership Act, the Forced Labor Act, the Representation of Native Act, Mixed Marriage Act, and the Education Act. There were some other ones, but these are the ones we shall focus on in this discussion. Now let's look at the Land Ownership Act. The Land Ownership Act was passed into law in the year 1913. By the provisions of this act, there was segregation between settlements in South Africa. Africans were banned or forbidden to live side by side with the Europeans. How did this happen? Before this time, Africans were living side by side with Europeans, especially on the farms. Those who were working for the Europeans normally squat on the farms and they were permitted by the Europeans. But as these laws was introduced, they were banned from living alongside the Europeans. Furthermore, they were required to carry what was known as pass. And what was a pass? A pass was just like an ID card that allows or permits you to move or enter the settlement that was occupied by the Europeans. This pass, without it, you cannot be found in those areas. You cannot be admitted or allowed to enter those areas. And again, even with the pass, you cannot seek employment or live in that area beyond 72 hours. This was very unbearable to South Africans. And as you can see in this image, you can see women who are protesting. Some of them carrying placards saying, with pass, we are slaves. And that is the truth, because in your own land, you are not supposed to carry 
a document that allows you to enter certain areas. You are restricted from entering certain areas. And these areas were mostly urban centers. So Africans were confined to the rural areas with the introduction of the Land Ownership Act of 1913. Let's look at the Forced Labor Act. The Forced Labor Act was also used to regulate labor relations in South Africa. By this act, Europeans were entitled to skilled labor while Africans were entitled to the unskilled labor. An example of the Forced Labor Act was the Mines and Work Act of 1911. This act was the act that formally put an end to the employment of Africans as skilled laborers in South Africa. Meaning that after 1911, unskilled labor or jobs were reserved for Africans, while the skilled jobs were meant for the Europeans. And you know what that means. Skilled work attracted higher salary or higher pay, while the unskilled ones attracted low salary. This was done in order to preserve the superiority and dominance of the Europeans in South Africa. In addition, the Industrial Act was also passed into law in the year 1937. By this Act of 1937, Africans and Europeans were not expected to belong to the same workers' union. This very Act was aimed at preventing the use of such union to demand for increase in salary and other welfare services by Africans, because as usual, this was normally expected. This brings us to another act that was passed by the parliament in South Africa. It was called the Representation of Native Act, and it was passed in the year 1936. What was the Representation of Native Act? This act was one that denied Africans the right to participate in the political process or in government. Before this time, especially in the Cape Colony, Africans took part in the voting process. But by this act, this right of voting was denied Africans by the Europeans. As if that was not enough, this very act, known as the Representation of Native Act, also empowers Africa to choose three Europeans that will represent them in the parliament and four at the Senate. Imagine you are denied the right to vote, so you cannot be represented. So you are now choosing a white man to represent you. So in all, this very act was one that established the foundation for segregation in political, social, and economic affairs in South Africa because it denied the blacks, Africans, of participation you know, you are from this place and you are not allowed to vote. You are not represented. You are now choosing somebody, a foreigner, a white man, to represent you. This was quite unfair. But it was established in South Africa. That was the act called the Representation of Native Act in 1936. Now, this brings us to another act that was passed in South Africa. This was called the Mixed Marriage Act of 1949. Before 1949... Intermarriage between Africans and Europeans was common in South Africa. But by this act, Europeans were banned or forbidden to marry Africans. As if that was not enough, there was a similar act that was passed into law by the parliament. This was called the Immorality Act, and it was passed into law in the year 1950. By the Immorality Act, it was illegal for any European to have a sexual relation with an African. This means that Europeans by this act try to preserve their racial identity, meaning that they don't want to have any child from a black person, and they don't want any white person to also marry a black person. So this act further strengthened apartheid in South Africa. There was also the Education Act, which was very, very important in South Africa. In South Africa, Western education was introduced by the missionaries, but it was reserved for the white. There was segregation. Blacks were denied the opportunity to attend schools with the whites. But there were some schools set aside for the blacks. But when government took over from the missionaries, 
government maintains segregational policies in the educational system. For instance, in the year 1953, government came up with a policy, with an act, and this was called the Bantu Education Act. By this act, the government of South Africa created different educational standard and curriculum for the Europeans and for Africans. Europeans were meant to attend certain schools, while certain schools were built mainly for the blacks. By this act, the Europeans saw agricultural education as the best option for Africans because to them, Africans were primitive and needed only agricultural education in order to work on the farms owned by Europeans. These various acts and some other ones led to the introduction of apartheid in South Africa. This brings us to African resistance to apartheid legislation in South Africa. Africans in South Africa strongly resisted apartheid ideas and apartheid legislation. This was because apartheid ideas and legislation supported white superiority. There were several forms of resistance to apartheid ideas and legislation. The first one was in the church, in the movement that was known as Ethiopianism or the Ethiopian movement. In the church, Africans were discriminated or segregated by the whites. They were not allowed to preach. They were not allowed to take up some responsibilities or positions. This frustration made Africans to form their own church. For instance, in the year 1884, the Temple Church was formed. Shortly after that period, there was also the formation of the African Church, and this took place in the year 1889. So from the angle of the church, there was resistance to the idea of apartheid. When the Union of South Africa was formed in 1910, and apartheid policies were introduced, there was also resistance. Let us look at the formation of political organizations, which was another form of resistance. In South Africa in the year 1909, there was a convention of the South African National Conference. This conference was attended by Africans. This conference was a reaction to the Anglo-Dutch Conference of 1808 and 1809. This conference was held in reaction to the British-Dutch Conference that decided that political rights in South Africa be given to only British and Dutch citizens. After the conference in 1909, some delegates were sent to the government to demand for equal political rights for the whites and for the blacks in South Africa, but this was not granted. Another body or association that was formed in South Africa to resist apartheid was the Imbumba Yama Africa Association of 1882. This body or political association was formed at the Cape Colony and it demanded for equal political opportunities for Africans and Europeans at the Cape, but this was also not granted to them, meaning that the association was not successful in its quest to resist apartheid policies in South Africa. This brings us to the South African National Congress that was formed in the year 1912. The South African National Congress was an association, in fact, a political party that was established by a South African lawyer by name Pigsley Ka Izaka Seme. He was a South African and he led the formation of this party. These party members met regularly to discuss how to end apartheid in South Africa. In the year 1923, the party was renamed the African National Congress or ANC. And even to date, that party still exists in South Africa. In fact, it is the major party in South Africa. Some measures were adopted by this party to resist apartheid in South Africa. And some of them were the writing of petitions to the government of South Africa, the sending of delegates to the British government in London, and lastly, by carrying out civil disobedience. Civil disobedience was the most effective tool or measure adopted by this party to fight or resist apartheid in South Africa. In 1919, when this party called for the destruction of passes, Africans massively responded and some had started destroying their passes, if not for the intervention of the police. Later on, the party became unpopular because of some failures 
This led to the formation of another party that was called the Pan-African Congress, PAC. However, in the early 1950s, the African National Congress was revived due to the presence of some leaders such as Abad Lutili, Oliver Tambo, Nelson Mandela, and Walter Sisulu. These leaders successfully organized some passive resistance to apartheid policies in South Africa. A very good example was in 1959 when it called for another destruction of pass. Although the PAC hijacked this move, which led to what was known as the Chaville Massacre of 1960. Now let's look at the suppression of African resistance to apartheid because African resistance was suppressed by the government of South Africa. So how did they suppress this resistance? And it was this suppression that made the resistance not to be successful. There were various ways by which the government of South Africa suppressed apartheid resistance in South Africa. Some of them were by acts of parliament, police brutality and spy network, as well as trial and imprisonment of African leaders, especially those of the ANC. Now let's look at acts of parliament. The South African government, through the parliament, was able to pass laws that restrain or forbid or control the activities of certain groups that were against the apartheid policies and legislation in South Africa. One example of such law was the Suppression of Communism Act that was passed into law in 1950. By this law, the Communist Party that was in existence in South Africa earlier before this time was banned. They were banned because they were carrying out anti-apartheid policies. They were organizing strikes and other things against the government. And so, the government simply banned this body. This was not the only act that forbids or restrains resistance. There was another one called the Unlawful Organization Act, and this was passed in the year 1960. By this one, Africans were not allowed to organize protests or form any body that was anti-apartheid. This act led to the ban of the activities of the African National Congress and the Pan-African Congress. With the ban placed on these bodies, they now operated from the background. They could not operate openly again, meaning that their activities were now secret. This brings us to police brutality and spy network. Police brutality and spy network was another measure that was used by the South African government to suppress resistance to apartheid. The police, as we all know, is an institution of the government that is saddled with the responsibility of maintaining law and order in the states. In South Africa, the government empowers the police to arrest, detain, and torture suspects or protesters of anti-apartheid policies. And they were even detained up to 12 days. By 1963, the length of time to which protesters could be detained was extended to 90 days and thereafter it was extended to an indefinite time, meaning that as a protester against apartheid, you could be arrested and detained indefinitely. This was what the police did in South Africa with the support of the government. With this, they were able to suppress anti-apartheid resistance. In 1968, the police in South Africa was reorganized and reformed. They were renamed the Bureau of State Security. One thing that accompanied this reorganization of the police was what was known as spy networks. They were able to connect the various cities and communities with spies, and these spies were Africans who were paid to give out information about the activities of the nationalists. In this way, they were able to arrest various leaders of nationalist activities in South Africa, and they were able to suppress anti-apartheid protesters. This means that apartheid continued to exist and grow in South Africa. The last instrument that was used by the government of South Africa to suppress apartheid resistance in South Africa was the trial and imprisonment of nationalist leaders, most especially the leaders of the African National Congress. Many leaders of the African National Congress 
were arrested and even given life sentences that is sent to life imprisonment. For instance, you have Nelson Mandela and Robert Sobukwe, among others. They were sent to Robben Island. Because of the arrest of the leaders of the ANC, there was a decline in the activities of the party in South Africa. Many of them went abroad or underground, meaning that they could not come out openly again because there was this fear of being arrested and given life sentences. These treatments together made apartheid to succeed or continue to exist in South Africa. With this treatment meted out to the leaders of ANC, apartheid continued to exist in South Africa but was finally brought to an end in the 1990s. Now let's consider the effects of apartheid legislation in South Africa. You may want to ask, what were the effects of apartheid legislation in South Africa? Apartheid legislation affected the people of South Africa to a large extent. This means that the people had some negative consequences as a result of the legislation. Let's look at some of them. Some of the effects of apartheid legislation in South Africa were denying Africans of basic freedom and fundamental rights. For instance, like the Land Ownership Act and the pass that was put into law in South Africa, Africans were restricted from moving into certain areas in their own land. This was against fundamental human rights. Africans were not allowed to walk to certain places. Even to seek employment, they needed a pass. This was a serious restriction and it affected Africans to a large measure. Furthermore, apartheid legislation in South Africa led to great suffering by the people of South Africa. Africans in South Africa were at the receiving end of all apartheid legislation in South Africa. This is because all the legislation were directed against Africans. And so it made them to suffer a lot. They suffer a lot because they could not seek employment beyond certain level. They were only entitled to unskilled labor. This was unfair and it inflicted great suffering on the people of South Africa. Lastly, apartheid legislation led to the loss of lives and properties in South Africa. During the various protests that were carried out by Africans against apartheid legislation in South Africa, the police normally shoot at the people, and this led to the death of many of them. In the Shaville massacre of 1960, about 69 Africans lost their lives. So, apartheid legislation led to the loss of lives and properties in South Africa. Though apartheid policy was abolished in South Africa in the year 1990, its effect cannot be overemphasized. This brings us to the end of this lesson. But now, let's take a look at what we have learned so far. In this lesson, we learned that apartheid legislations were laws passed to strengthen apartheid. Also, we learned that some apartheid laws against the African population in South Africa were Land Ownership Act, Mixed Marriage Act, and some others. Moving on, we learned that African resistance to apartheid took various forms such as the utopian movement and formation of political associations and parties. Furthermore, we learned that African resistance were suppressed through police brutality and imprisonment of African leaders. And lastly, some effects of apartheid in South Africa were denial of rights and freedom to Africans in South Africa and loss of lives and properties. Now, let us take some questions to test our knowledge on what we have done so far. Question 1. Which of the following was not an example of the apartheid legislations in South Africa? A. Mixed Marriage Act B. Law Enforcement Act or C. Representation of Native Act The correct answer is B. Law Enforcement Act now let's take the second question. 
Which of the following was an effect of apartheid legislation on Africans in South Africa? A. Increased welfare services for Africans. B. Political participation by Africans. Or C. Denial of basic rights and freedom. The correct answer is C. Denial of basic rights and freedom. I want to believe that you can now discuss the legislative provisions against African populations in South Africa and state the effects of apartheid legislation in South Africa. Thank you and see you in our next class.